but it, it just kind of uh, is an introductory kind of thing, you know, but that's not part of the Constitution. And he's right from his point of view because the attorneys all deal with statutory law. They're all inside that shadow of the Constitution. Whereas the, uh, uh, the, the uh, preamble basically sets the foundation for what this is all about. We the people ordain and establish this system for you guys over there. This is how we want you guys to run this for our benefit. These are your operating rules. That constitution was not written for you and me, it was written for them. And it doesn't apply to you and me. We're in our sovereign capacity. We can dump that anytime we want. Okay? So, and how do we dump it? Well, my favorite way to dump it is to go to court you know, and make them toe the line in court. You know? I mean, that's what I did one time. Went to court and uh, the judge issued an order. I issued an order vacating his order. Later on, he forgot and he issued a second order. So then I issued an order that vacated that second order. And I fined him for contempt of court. Okay? And by the way, on this CD that you've got, that case appears. Okay? And so you can look at it. It has, you look at the contempt ruling and you get the entire foundation of what, how that relationship between you and that judge is defined and why it is that you outrank that judge. Okay, it's all there. So, anyway, um, the preamble sets the whole character of the game. And if you, in your sovereign capacity, choose not to play the game, that's your right. Okay? Because, just think of it this way. If you uh, owned a company and you hired somebody, and you said to that somebody, look, you're going to be the manager. I'm going to let you run the company, and I'm going to be the janitor. <clears throat> now, when you take the job of janitor, and you're cleaning up around the company that you own, is there anything to stop you from taking over the manager's job anytime you want to? <clears throat> Not at all. And so that's the relationship we have with the judge. When you own the country, then he works for you. And if he's not doing the job, you're entitled to order him right out. Okay? So, um, all right, after the Declaration of Independence, but before the ordainment and establishment of the Constitution, the people of the United States pretty much handled their own affairs using the common law. Now, everybody was educated in the common law, so that's what made it possible. Jefferson said that to this effect, I'm paraphrasing, but he said that ignorance and liberty cannot coexist. So the United States of America, or before it became the United States of America, when it was just colonies, was the biggest buyer of legal marriage. That's the nobility. Okay? Citizens are not peers. In fact, there was a case, I think I told you about this last time I was here, guy down in San Diego I heard about. He demanded a jury of his peers, and he knew what a peer was. The judge couldn't find one. Couldn't, could not find a single member of, a potential member of the jury who would admit that he wasn't a citizen. Okay? That he was a member of the sovereignty. And so, uh, finally he sent the sheriff out to see if he could find some peers. Couldn't find them. Had to report back. Eventually they had to dismiss the case because they couldn't assemble a proper jury. <laughs> I wish I met that guy. I wish I knew who he was. I'd like to talk to him more. I just got that second hand. I've never forgot that story. So, <clears throat> all right, so here's a court case in Lansing versus Smith that occurred in New York. And by the way, on these sites here, you'll see where it says uh, Lansing v. Smith for Wend, okay, short for Wendell. Uh, basically, page 9, volume 4, page 9. What that is, is that back in the early days of our court system, the uh, court records were the personal records of the clerk. 
And uh, they, a lot of these records got lost because, you know, they were personal records, they were in their homes and things happened. So the, uh, uh, when they cite those old cases, they cite the clerk's name. And it's, so it's volume four of Wendell, page nine. And the year was 1829. Okay. And uh, so anyway, in that case, the, uh, the court said, the people of this state, as the successors of its former sovereign, are entitled to all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative. By his prerogative. What are your rights? Well, it's whatever you say they are. Okay? Your only limitation on your rights is that you may not impose your will on another sovereign. Okay? You can contract with another sovereign, but you can't impose your will on them. And so your rights stop where mine start. Okay? There's an invisible border between us that we have to respect. Of course, if we get into a dispute about it, that's what the court process is all about. But basically, um, this is the important concept, that all the rights which formerly belonged to the king by his prerogative, he determined, you want to know what the king's rights were or are? He'll tell you. You just ask him. Those are my rights. So if I want to drive down the left side of the street, that's my prerogative. I call that a right. But you see, we, we have at least you've heard it advertised. We have this principle that you're innocent until proven guilty. And what's the basis? The basis is, did you harm someone? Okay? If you have no corpus delicti, if there's no body of the crime, then there's no, no basis for prosecution. Okay? You're presumed innocent. If nothing went wrong, you must have had things under control. But if you screw up, then the penalties are very severe. Um, did you know that, for example, first-time burglary is what, 30 days? Isn't that what it is? In, under the uh, statutory laws, the codes, penal code? Something like that, 30 days for a minor burglary. Under common law, it's a death penalty. If you've ever been burglarized, I'm sure you felt like killing whoever did it. You know. So the, uh, uh, the statutes are rather kind to criminals. But the, the thing is, is that the rights are by your prerogative, whatever they are. Now let's compare that with citizenship. A citizen is subject, okay? Here we are. We get into the definition of citizen of the United States. It's the 14th Amendment. Um, before ratification of the Amendment 14, there was no legal definition of the term citizen of the United States. The term was used, but only generally. It was not a legal term. It was a conversational term. Okay? After the Civil War, the slaves were freed, but there was no legal basis to recognize them as being uh, of having any rights. Amendment 14 partially solved that problem. If you're a citizen of the United States, which all the slaves were, then this constitutional amendment imposed on the states the requirement that they must accept that person as a citizen of that state if he's living there. Okay? That's how they, because there was no legal basis from the state's point of view for recognizing these slaves that were now freed because they, they came from out of the country. Even if they were born here, they were from out of the country. So to get them accepted. But look what happened. What happened was that the slaves were privately owned and they got released into what amounted to public ownership. Right? Citizens of the United States, they're subject to the jurisdiction. They are now publicly owned. But what a neat deal. Isn't it nice to have slaves for whom you are not responsible to feed them? You're not responsible to clothe them. You're not responsible to house them. And yet you have control of them. 